Hello, my name is Megan Thoreau and I'm an Ohio State University Extension educator with a poster presentation on how the pandemic is forcing women from the workforce. Can Extension's workforce development programs respond to this crisis? Well, here's some basic statistics to start from. We have women earning more bachelor degrees than men since 1982, more master degrees than men since 1987, and more doctoral degrees than men since 2006. Yet still to this day, women earn 82 cents for every dollar a man earns. And in a crisis like the pandemic, it's typically the lower earning female that's forced to cut back on work to care for the children. Looking at women in the workforce, it was 1999 when women were at their peak, around 60%, and ever since then they've been declining. Now pre-COVID numbers report 76.8 million women, 16 and older, represent 47% of the labor force, compared to 53% of the men. On top of the pandemic, women are also going to have struggles with automation. 58% of women are more likely to lose their jobs than men due to automation, and it's because of the work sectors that they're working in. A lot of responsibility has gone into remote learning and supporting their children. 80% of working mothers have taken the lead in this remote learning requirement, while 31% of working fathers have taken the lead. Together, 40% of working parents have quit or reduce their work hours since the pandemic has began. COVID-19 has reshaped the lives of all Americans. Changes at home and work have hit women especially hard, even worse for women of color. This period has been what economics call the sea session. The mass exodus of more than 25 million women left the workforce at the beginning of the pandemic. Many women eventually returned, but a huge number are leaving their careers to fill gaps of childcare and K-12 education. January's 2021 jobs report showed 2.4 million women exited the workforce compared to 1.8 million men. The underlining questions, whose professional time we value most and whose is dispensable? And how can extension support and retain women in the workplace? We have to also acknowledge gender equality and how it's in reverse right now. We're losing some of the best female leaders to caregiving and educational duties, sending gender equality backwards 10 years. Businesses and institutions need to start taking a hard look at what changes they can make to help women stay employed. Extension needs to be sensitive to this loss of female leadership, both internally and externally, through assessing our institutional policies, our community needs, and providing demand-led programming. I created some infographics to help visualize some of the issues and statistics around women in the workforce. So taking a closer look, we can see that 40% of women are suffering or struggling in the workforce compared to 43% of men. We also talked about women in leadership roles. 23.5% of women hold S&P 500 board seats in 2020. This is a 2.5% loss from the previous year. Now, when we consider women overall, 37% have felt consistently exhausted since COVID-19 started. However, focusing specifically on women with young children, we see an exhaustion level increasing to 42%. Senior level women, 54%. Black women, 40%. Lastly, 23% of women with children under 10 are considering leaving the workforce versus men at 13%. Now I place this quote in the center of the poster because it's pretty important to recognize that the pandemic by itself isn't hurting women's careers. It's merely highlighting in bright fluorescent yellow marker the existing inequalities in the workplace and society that already created deep-seated disparities between men and women, from the gender pay gap to the lack of women in executive leadership roles. So now let's just take a moment and let those 
statistics take hold. And as extension educators, let's figure out how can extension respond, engage, and develop programming and resources that can address women in the workforce and the crisis that they're in. So extension can engage and develop educator partners to redefine what education looks like, including remote learning support, so that families can spend more time together in the evenings than doing schoolwork. We can also engage and develop resources that connect parents with at-home care providers in their community through the use of technology. We can develop programs and outreach that bring new teachers into the field of early education and care, supporting child care programs and helping transform early learning centers and neighborhood resource hubs to support local families with young children. Extension can make the workplace better for women. And we can do this in a number of ways. First, we can engage community business partners with equitable workplace review programs and resources to promote flexible work plans, switching from email to a simpler message-based communication platform like Slack or Teams, by scheduling work meetings into predictable chunks of the day or in the month, by redefining what constitutes a full workday or a full work week and how an employee's productivity is evaluated. We can also move away from any billable hour compensation schemes that we utilize. We can also bring equitable changes for all by sharing resources that educate on how federal and local subsidies can impact workers' equality across the board rather than doing a piecemeal approach by going to employer to employer. And lastly, we can help develop employee retention programs that evaluate not just how employees work, but how they work and what kinds of work that they're working on to keep work meaningful. So it's important for us to realize that we don't want to go backwards to the way it's always been. Employers, extension, we have to think boldly forward. Research by McKenzie and Company has showed profits and performance can be 50% higher in workplaces where women are well represented at the top. We should let COVID-19 be a reset button to rewrite the workplace rules to create a more equitable and productive work environment. And we can do this by making flexibility the new normal and recognize that FaceTime can be overrated. The pandemic has taught us to make connections and build culture virtually. The traditional in-person nine to five structure is out and can be counterproductive. We need to start letting employees choose how often they wanna physically come in the office. We have to remember that impact is more important than in-person office time. The University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee study found that one third of women leave companies that are not flexible enough to accommodate adequate work-life balance. Even before the pandemic, millennials and Generation Z wanted change. They wanted more flexibility in the workplaces and responsive working environments. We also need to start adjusting our expectations in rethinking performance reviews, reevaluating how performance reviews are conducted and monitored for potential biases against employees with caregiving responsibilities. This can avoid burnout, anxiety, and ultimately less productivity. We need to start factoring in caregiving status and talent evaluations including promotional reviews that weigh long-term performances, trends, and future potential more. It's also important that we acknowledge that the child care system is broken and employers must be a part of the solution. Companies and organizations need to invest in child care so that working mothers don't have to choose between their families versus their careers. Employer child care subsidies learning centers that accommodate employees' school-aged children with remote learning. Educate the community. Child care is a basic infrastructure need required to be maintained for working families. We also need to make sure that there's no penalties to the women who left the workforce or reduce their work hours due to COVID-19. Women should return to the workforce with confidence because smart employers will recognize how the pandemic has set back female employees and should be figuring out ways to creatively woo them back. And lastly, we have to acknowledge and honor Ruth Bader Ginsburg's mantra, this child has two parents. 
According to the Boston Consulting Company, like women, men have had to double their child care and educational duties to 37 hours per week on average. Yet women still bear a bigger burden at home. But the two-pronged parenting approach should become a standard going forward by employers. So now let's consider remote work. Because there's a lot of benefits, but there's also certain drawbacks when it comes to gender inequality. So the things that are really working for remote work for women, it removes the trailing spouse effect. Being able to work from any geographic location fills talent pools with more women who, if married, are less likely than married men to relocate for their jobs. It also allows employers to hire top talent from all over the state, country, or world, building more dynamic, diverse remote working units. It also helps mitigate the height bias that exists, where height influences earning potential in many careers. Workers that are six feet tall can expect to earn nearly $166,000 more during a 30-year career than a colleague seven inches shorter. There's also the fact that women want to work from home. Research finds that 98% of women want to work from home at least once a week and 76% want their companies to offer more flexible schedules. The Pew Research Center reports the lack of workplace flexibility keeps 51% of working mothers from advancing their careers versus 16% of working fathers. There's also the reduction of regular commute time. There's the benefit of increased productivity, and it supports work-life balance goals through proactive policy changes, not just talk. Now, the things to watch for when it comes to remote learning is that women can become more invisible, and this leads to fewer opportunities for the advancement since managers often assign projects to those who see or have frequent contact with. The inequitable behavior also can go unnoticed. It's difficult to observe correct inequitable practices when working remotely. Ensuring that everyone's voice is heard during a Zoom call can be difficult and it's a different way of doing business than ensuring that everyone's voice is heard and respected in an in-person setting. However, these drawbacks have solutions. Artificial intelligence, AI platforms, can ensure human capital management decisions that are made across an entire organization are equitable, transparent, data-driven, and free of biases. This is especially important when it comes to decisions of pay, performance, and promotional decisions. Using AI platforms removes the ambiguities and the biases that are very prevalent in management decisions. Plus, it replaces the informal or relationship-based promotion opportunities with objective, data-driven decision-making. Well, thank you. I hope you found this topic interesting and devote some additional research to looking at how you can develop some extension programming and outreach material to address and create some solutions for your working community. My email is below. Please reach out. I'm out of the Pickaway County office at OSU Extension in Ohio. Take care.